knowing ourselves is difficult, right? This is the hardest thing to do. And I hope that this discussion gives us more concrete evidence as to why that's the case, why knowing ourselves is so difficult. It's not insurmountable. And perhaps this is something that is important to emphasize. So yes, we have dualism and yes, we have essentialism. And yes, they whisper these crazy mantras in our ears, but then we have reasoning and we have rationalities and we have tools to counteract them. And the hope is that by understanding our biases, we should be able to better understand ourselves. Welcome to Brain Science, a podcast where we explore how discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 182. If you're curious about how your brain really works, this is the podcast for you. This month's guest is Dr. Iris Berant from Northeastern University, and we will be talking about her new book, The Blind Storyteller, How We Reason About Human Nature. As you might have guessed by the excerpt that opened this episode, our focus is going to be on how essentialism and dualism bias our ability to understand ourselves. Before we jump into the interview, I want to remind you that you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. Brain Science is produced independently and relies on the financial support of listeners like you. To learn more, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Please send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. We also have a fan page on Facebook, and you can follow me on Twitter where I'm at Doc Artemis. If you'd like to get show notes automatically every month, you can get the newsletter by texting the word brain science to 55444. That's brain science, all one word, to 55444. There's also a link to the newsletter on the website. I'll be back after the interview to review the key ideas and to share a few brief announcements. Hi, Iris Berent. Hello. I'm so happy to have you on the show today to talk about your new book, The Blind Storyteller, How We Reason About Human Nature. Would you mind, Iris, just starting out by telling us a little bit about yourself? So I'm a cognitive scientist. I'm a professor of psychology at Northeastern University, the Department of Psychology. That's pretty much it. And what is your main area, before writing this book, your main area of research had to do with language? Would you tell us about that? Sure, right. So I've spent most of my career looking at language. And the reason why I think language is interesting is not so much because of the intricacy of linguistics or anything like that, but rather because I think that language really offers a window into human nature. We have language other species do not. They have systems of communication, but they don't have language in as much that the structure, the anatomy of their communication system is demonstrably different to ours. And when we've been trying to teach them, when we try to take apes or kittens and talk to them, they do not learn language, they do not produce language. And the big question is why? One position advocated by Noam Chomsky, by Steven Pinker, is the idea that our capacity for language is due to some specialized mechanism that is designed and selected for language specifically. The alternative is that there is nothing special about language, rather We have a language as a species because we are smart, because we have good perceptual abilities, good motor capacities, we are social people. And if you take all those ingredients, mix them together, language is going to emerge. So the big challenge is this field is to adjudicate between these positions. And that's what I've been trying to do in my work on language. And we're not going to talk about that today because we would have a whole interview, so maybe sometime in the future. Because your new book is about something entirely different. So would you tell us a little bit about how that new book came about? And you can use whatever examples that help you to get going that you want. So maybe we can actually start from the results that I got from language, because I think we don't know for sure, right? We don't know the answer for sure, but 
given the evidence that we have, I think that the possibility that we do have a specialized language instinct is a plausible hypothesis. In my experience trying to communicate this line of research to lay people, I found a little bit of blank gazes when I talk about it or even some surprise. And my sense was that people are not, they have no problem with the evidence. They're not saying you didn't control for X, Y, or Z, you know, your stats are not adequate, something like that. But rather my sense was that the question itself, really asking or postulating the possibility that some knowledge of language could be innate, they thought that this is a totally crazy proposal. And I never understood why it's a, a, a crazy proposal in the 20th, 21st century, the era of the genome. We know that there is a genetic basis for why we have two arms and not two wings. There is a genetic basis of why you know, we are predisposed to cancer. Why can't there be an innate, therefore, genetic disposition that would explain why is it that human have language as well as other cognitive capacities. So why is it not possible for knowledge, knowledge of language to be partly innate? And I found it frustrating for a very long time. And I just tried to combat that by explaining my position better and telling people, listen, this is why this is, this is the proposal. This is what it says. Listen, right? And after a while, I thought, there's something going on here, so we better figure out what's going on, right? So is it the case that people are actually inherently opposed, resistant to the notion of knowledge or ideas being innate? Is there a thing there? And if that's the case, then why such biases might emerge? So I figured, well, I'm a cognitive scientist. I know how to do this kind of experiments. Let's find out. The results suggested that people are, in fact, guilty as charged. And sometimes you can actually show that what people are telling you is demonstrably wrong. It's opposite to what science actually is telling us. So then the question is why people are biased in this way. And it turns out that those biases are pretty broad. They concern many phenomena of how we view ourselves, how we view our human nature. So after some consideration, the thesis of the book came out, which is the claim that we are inherently blind to our human nature. And as it turns out, that our blindness to human nature arises from human nature itself, from the very principles that very likely could be innate in humans, and it's those principles that blind us or constrain how we view who we really are, and the thesis that this book explores. And I really like that because it reminds me of my friend Robert Burton's work, because he says that trying to study the mind with the mind is like going to a con man for information. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And people have long wondered whether the, we are kind of, a, we have a conflict of interest when we look at who we are. And it turns out that, yes, we do. And this conflict can possibly arise by design, that it's really how our mind works that obscures from us the workings of the mind. There are a couple of main, you might say, biases or blindings that that you discuss in the book, dualism and essentialism. Would you like to talk about those and how you came about to the idea that those are the two main ones? So maybe we should start by saying that the bias that we observe, so the thesis is that our resistance to the notion, or maybe I sh should backtrack and say that our reasoning about human nature is constrained by these two basic principles that shape how we think about nature generally, and one is dualism and the other is essentialism. Dualism is the belief, the intuitive tacit belief that the mind is ephemeral, distinct from the body. So bodies are made out of matter, minds are made out of something else. Now, this is, of course, a position that is identified with philosophy, with the work of René Descartes, but we're not talking about philosophy here. The claim is that this is how we think about ourselves intuitively, 
tacitly, completely under the hood. Essentialism is likewise another principle of intuitive psychology, which we employ primarily when we think about biology, about living things. And there the question that we ask ourselves is, why are living things the way they are? Why is it that the dog is brown like its mother? And our intuition there is that living things are what they are because they acquire some innate immutable essence from their parents. So the dog is what it is because its mother gave it some piece of matter, some essence that is immutable, that is always going to stay the same. It's not going to change. It is acquired inherent, innately by virtue of its being the biological offspring of that mother. And that's what explains its properties. That's what explained its biological kind. And these two principles together, when you look at them carefully, you see that they're actually in a tug of war, that they're incompatible with each other. And it's this perfect storm, it's the collision between these two principles that lead to our difficulties in reasoning about who we really are. So what do we know about dualism and essentialism as far as when it appears in humans, when they appear? So maybe to put it in perspective, so I think be behind your question is the concern or, or the, you're wondering, are those principles possibly innate or are, are they coming from culture? There are several reasons to think why those principles could possibly be based in innate constraints. Now, for dualism, the claim is not that dualism itself is innate. There is no reason why evolution should care about how we think about minds and bodies, but there is lots of reasons why evolution might be invested in constraining how we think about the physical world and how we think about living things and agents and their properties. And if you look at the infant literature, you see that even young infants think about objects and agents, about people, by following different principles. So young infants would be surprised if they see an object start moving all by itself. What they would expect is rather that the object would move by mechanical contact with another object. There are experiments that demonstrate this in newborns. So the idea is that, and this is going back to the work of Elizabeth Spelke, that our knowledge of the physical world about object is that objects move by mechanical principles of contact, con continuity, and cohesion. This is physical objects. Interestingly, when we come to think about people, about agents, here we actually suspend those physical principles, and then we totally expect people to move by their own accord, by their own goals, by their own mental states. There are experiments that demonstrate that in young infants. So for example, infants are would not be the least surprised if they would see two people and then one of them start moving by itself without being bumped by the other. That is totally unsurprising. And in fact, they would expect agents to follow goals. So three months old prefer people who try to help others than to those that hinder others. So those attribution of mental states are present very early in infants. And the thing is that if we think about the physical and the psychological world by following different principles, that in essence, we are in fact dualist. And it's those two core principles of core knowledge about the physical and psychological world that explains why we turn out to be dualist. Dualism itself can be demonstrated in also in adults. So there are experiments that show that basically when you invite adults to think about what happens if you do some manipulations to the body, which properties of the body are going to be affected by this manipulation? So to be concrete, what happened if you took a person and you had some futuristic situation in which you replicated the person's body? The answer is people think that physical properties of the person, its hair color, its body structure, will transfer to the replica. Whereas what they know, those mental states are not going to transfer. That suggests that people think about mental states as distinct from physical states. Now, you might think, well, maybe just people are confused about those mental states. That's why they think they are not likely to transfer. Maybe they're too abstract, something like that. But it turns out that if you follow a different manipulation, if you ask people to think about what happens in conditions that target the mind, 
such as what transfers to the afterlife, right? What happens when the body demises? There's no longer body. What properties may remain? Presumably the, those are properties of the mind. And the answer there is it's the mental states of the person that are likely to transfer and not the physical states. And that demonstrates that really people have those different sets of principles about body and minds. This is not just a Western phenomenon. So really interesting work has demonstrated those principles, even in a small scale society in which people do not reason about the minds of others. So it's not polite to speculate about what other people think and feel. But when the attitudes of members of the society were examined, the answer came out exactly as in Westerners, they too thought that mental states can transfer from one character to another. So that suggests to us that dualist thinking may very well be innate in the sense that this is how humans reason generally. Essentialism likewise seems to be a general characteristic of human reasoning. There is debate in the essentialist literature as to when exactly essentialist reasoning arises. It's not clear that you see that in young children, but interestingly, you see it reliably. And once again, you see it even in societies in which people do not think about nature as we do. So even when the culture thinks about the properties So the the belief is that living things acquire their properties by social interactions, not by inheritance. Even in this culture, still people believe in essentialism. What we mean by that is, for example, if invited to ask what happens if you had switch at birth situations, so you take a pig and have a piggy baby and have it raised by cows, what it's going to grow up to be? Is it going to resemble its parents, the cows, as the culture claims, or is it going to resemble its biological parents, as we know to be true? Even in those societies which deny biological inheritance, people would still eventually say that the cow will maintain the biological properties of its biological parents, suggesting that there is this belief that there is an immutable essence that living things acquire from the biological parents. Other results suggest that this essence is immutable. So if you took a skunk and painted it and it's still children know that it's not going to change into a raccoon. This is the work of Frank Kyle, for instance. So those suggest that adults, regardless of their experiences, arrive at the conclusion that there is an essence to living things. And furthermore, I should say that this essence not only is biological and defines biological kind, but if you look at this literature carefully, you see that people think about that essence as a property of the body. For example, when you ask children again, why is it that the dog is brown like its mother? The answer that they give you is it got this tiny piece of matter that it got from the mother, the work of Springer and Cal. In other cases, you ask children, how do you know what kind of animal is hiding in a fossil, right? Where should you take a sample in order to figure out what kind of animal it is? The answer comes out, you have to sample from the center. So that suggests that children believe that that essence, that special character that defines the the species has a physical location in space, which again is a property of matter. And In other work, there is evidence that sometimes people even link this essence to a particular bodily substance, say, to blood. So all these properties of being discrete, being in the inside and the center of an organism and having some bodily manifestations are all properties of matter. I want to take a moment to tell you about our new sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal company. Green Chef makes eating well easy and affordable with a wide variety of plans, including keto, paleo, vegan, and vegetarian. The organic ingredients come pre-measured, perfectly portioned, and mostly prepped, so you can spend less time stressing and more time enjoying delicious home-cooked meals. There are nine choices for each plan every week, so you never get bored. 
I've used GreenShift off and on for years. I really appreciate the low carb options and the wide variety of recipes. GreenChef is the number one meal kit for eating well. If you'd like to give it a try, go to greenchef.com forward slash 90 G-I-N-G-E-R and use the code 90 G-I-N-G-E-R to get $90 off, including free shipping. That's greenchef.com forward slash 90 G-I-N-G-E-R and use the code 90 G-I-N-G-E-R. That suggests to us that when we think about inheritance, when we think about innateness, we think we associate it with the body and rather than with the mind. And given that we are, on the other hand, also dualists, I think you can now begin to see that there is going to be some interesting tension between these two principles, between dualism and essentialism. What's the, the main conflict between these two ideas? Right. So... The conflict arises because essentialism tells us that our innate essence resides in our body. When we look to what defines us as biologically, the answer resides in some material piece of matter in the body. The problem is that per dualism, our mental states, our knowledge, everything is not in the body, it's in the mind, which means that all this stuff is in the wrong place for being innate, right? Because dualism tells us knowledge is in the mind, and essentialism tells us the innate stuff is in the body. So knowledge simply cannot be innate by this formulation. So we know the literature on dualism and essentialism is huge. We know very well there is good evidence that those two principles exist. What has not been noticed before is that they stand in conflict, that if you look at dualism and essentialism, they are mutually incompatible with each other. And in this book, I follow the conflict and look at various instances in which this conflict really messes up with how we think about who we are. The first one I think that stands out for me is just this whole idea that ideas can be innate, because it sounds based on these that it can't. Why does that matter? It matters because the question of innate ideas happens to be one of the most debated issues in the history of ideas, going back to Plato. I mean, this question has been there forever. And I think this is one of the questions that also was the relies in the origin of cognitive science. We were entrusted as cognitive scientists and neuroscientists with this question of innateness. And we were told, you have the tools to explore it. You can go to the lab, you can run experiments, you have imaging, you have genetic tools. You should be able to figure it out. And we don't. I don't think we're getting even close to figuring it out. And Given this track record, I think the question arises, why is that such a difficult question? And one of the implications of this book is maybe the problem is really in part in the human inquirer. Maybe it is our way of thinking about who we are that obscures our human nature from ourselves. One of the things that stood out for me when I was reading your book was, and you gave many experimental situations, and the one that fascinated me the most that I think also might interest my listeners is what happens when you present information that, say, a particular thing, let's say numbers, for example, because the evidence that we have an innate number sense is very solid, and you present that information to people, and you give them one of your experiments, and it doesn't seem to change the results. Right. So the first task, so when I started, when this possibility that we are biased about innate ideas and we have a problem with this, when this arose, I thought, well, we need to run experiments and test whether this is really the case. And I follow different strategies in doing it, but one of them was to simply take experiments that look at infants, experiments for which we know what really is the right answer, 
present the same situations to people and ask them to predict what would happen. So, for example, we know that newborn infants can track number. We know that they can tell differences between, say, 10 versus 20, and their notions of number is abstract, meaning that they can tell that 10 lights and 10 sounds share abstract property dif different, say, from 10 versus 20. So what we did in the experiment is presented people with the exact description of what happened in the experiment of, in this case, of Izard and colleagues, and told them this is what the research did. We simplified it slightly. So we said two sounds and two lights versus four because we thought 10 versus 20 is too difficult. So we told people, listen, this is what happened in the experiment. First, people look at two sounds consistently, and then they see either two lights or four lights. Here is the rational. Researchers expect that if infants, in fact, can track abstract number, then if the number of lights and sound are going to be, is going to be congruent, then infants would be more interested in that than if it's incongruent. What do you think will happen? Will infants look longer at the congruent number compared to the incongruent number? And the answer is people said, no, they won't. We know that that's wrong. In other words, people thought there's no way newborns, infants have any notion of abstract number. We know that this is actually true. We asked similar questions about other aspects of knowledge. We asked them, I mentioned the helper hinderer task by Hamlin and colleagues. So we know that three months old prefer creatures that help others compared to ones that hinder them. So in the task, you see a creature trying to go up the hill, and then there is another creature that comes and either helps him go up the hill by pushing him up or hindering the action by pushing them down. When presented to infants, infants prefer looking at the helper. They Later on, when they're older, they prefer grabbing the helper and so forth. So we presented the same description to people and told them, OK, tell us what do you think infants will do? And this is the rational. And if it's so, that's what is expected. And again, the answer is no way. Infants should have no preference that relates to morality in this case. Yet another experiment, we asked them about syllable structure, which is an example that comes from my own research. So we know that newborn infants prefer syllables like blog, syllables that are popular across languages, compared to syllables like lbog, L-B-O-G, which are not popular across languages. We see that in the brain when there are newborns. We ask people what will happen. They thought there's no way, basically, they, they were sitting on the fence. They didn't go one way or another in this case, but certainly they did not think that infants will show the preferences that, in fact, they do. So all those suggest that when it comes to knowledge, to those abstract ideas, people do not believe that ideas are innate. We ask that in other ways of people, we ask them about non-human animals, we ask them about birds, right? What about the structure of the bird song? Is there any possibility that that will emerge spontaneously in birds without learning it from others? People said no way, and so forth. What's important is that it is not a generalized aversion to innateness in general. So when we ask them, what happens about emotions? Do you think that going to the newborn infant experiment, do you think that infants will actually prefer happy faces to angry faces? Here, the science actually tells us that they don't. When we ask people, they say, sure they will. They certainly should prefer the happy faces. And again, people are wrong. So people are wrong in specific ways and they're wrong on both counts. When it comes to ideas, they reject innate ideas. When it comes to emotions, actions, and sensations, those properties, they think, yes, yeah, surely those must be innate. They must be present in infants and they will emerge spontaneously in people who had no experience with those. So. We have a problem, Houston. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you're arguing that even the scientists are going to be influenced by these biases. I mean, that's going to influence the questions we ask, right? So it might, right? So in as, I, I'm trying to tread carefully here in as much that, so we haven't talked about the biases, but I'm happy to spell it out later. The dualism and essentialism explain those biases. Maybe I should do it now, right? So dualism tells us that knowledge is ephemeral and therefore it's in the wrong place for being innate. Innateness is in the body, knowledge is not there. 
But when it comes to emotions, we think that we can re read emotions right off somebody's face. Emotions are in the body. Actions are in the body. We walk with our legs. We hear with our ears. We can identify specific bodily organs that are the source of those mental states. And therefore, if we believe that innateness resides in the body, it stands to reason that people would think that emotions, actions, all those things are exactly in the right place for being innate. And for this reason, people jump to the conclusions incorrectly. Well, I, I don't know if incorrectly, but as far as facial emotions are concerned, that probably is incorrect to assume that facial emotions are innate, yet people jump to this conclusion. Does it affect scientists? Well, here we need to be careful, right? Because the fact that there are biases doesn't mean that they're insurmountable. And scientists are trained to think rationally, and certainly our rational capacity should allow us to at least partly counteract these biases as we're trying to do here when we talk about it. So the fact that there are biases like that does not license me to say that anybody who doesn't agree with my scientific position is biased, right? That's not the argument I'm trying to make here. Having said that, we can nonetheless say that in as much that scientists are humans and humans are so biased, then scientists are in danger and we better be careful to those biases because when we don't hit them, we could follow them and yes, they could taint our scientific work. Whether in fact they do, I think that remains to be explored farther. But in the book, I do suggest some anecdotal evidence where that could be the case. But it definitely influences how lay people respond to neuroscience. So could you talk a little bit about how we see that in the real world with lay people and their attitudes toward neuroscience? Because it really explains some of the, what seem to me, paradoxical things about people's reactions. Yeah. So th there is this thing that people are insane about the brain. Sane here stands for the seductive allure of neuroscience, so it's a thing. Before maybe talking to about the, the, and there is a literature on that, which we can discuss, but you can see it all over the place. The New York Times the other day had this piece about, oh, your child is upset. It's not, they have a tantrum. Well, it's not that just have their tantrum. It's the amygdala that made them do that. Well, why does invoking the amygdala tells you anything, what, what does it tell you any more than saying, you know, this child, your child is tired, your child is upset. And there is this sense of explanation that we get by invoking the brain in a completely irrational way. So you see these headlines in the newspapers about how musicians' brains are different to non-musicians' brains. Well, what do you expect else to happen, right? You hear that they're different. One can play the violin, the other can't play the violin. Where will the difference arise other than in the brain? Why is that surprising? Now, in fairness, of course, the research is not just to say that there is difference, but rather we found this difference here and there and there and there. But when the lay people read it, what they get out of it is here, it's true, there is a real difference. But of course we know it's true, there is a difference, right? So why would you not expect to have a difference? Well, if you're a dualist, you won't. If a dualist, if you are a dualist, then you expect the difference to only reside in the mind and therefore learning that this difference, especially when it comes to knowledge, to those ephemeral things, that it actually resides in the body, for you, it's big news and, in fact, a big source of difficulty because as a dualist, you have trouble reconciling this information, hence the surprise. Beyond anecdotal evidence, as I mentioned, there is, in fact, literature on that. It started with the work of Dina Weisberg, who showed that people are systematically biased in reasoning about the brain. So when you give them an explanation that invokes the brain, they find the explanation more satisfying in fact, they find it more satisfying compared to a behavioral explanation. Even when both explanations are actually bad, they still fall for the brain explanation. Why that actually happens, I don't think we actually understand very well. The first explanation that comes to mind is the brain has this allure of science. Maybe that's what makes people fall for it. It's maybe it's the mentioning of all these technicalities of fMRI and so forth. But it turns out that that's not the case because 
just by telling people that you can observe the phenomenon in the brain without invoking any special gadgets, people still think the explanation is better. It's not about imagery. Again, you don't need to show people the images of the brain to elicit this effect. Reductionism is another explanation for that. So in science, we often like to go from one level of analysis to another, say from chemistry to physics. That has something to do with that. But again, the pleasure that people get, the satisfaction that they get from going from behavior to the brain is much larger than in any other form of reduction. So what's going on? So I think that there are two things that are going on, dualism and essentialism. From the point of dualism, if you're a dualist and you're looking at everyday behavior, you should actually have a problem because if I can combine my hand to move to this battle and, and grab it, then this is a mystery. How can my thought of going to the water battle command my material hand to move? How can mind influence matter? And in general, how can thinking affect behavior? Brain explanations solve this mystery because they're telling us, listen, this problem that you're experiencing here, this dualist dissonance actually doesn't exist. It's not the mind that commands matter, it's matter that commands matter. It's the brain that commands your material hand to move. For the dualist, this is a much more satisfying explanation and that is expected to elicit the preference to the brain. To explore this possibility, my graduate student, Gwen Sadovo and I, looked at the precise circumstances that lead people to prefer brain explanations. And what we found as expected is, so what's expected first, what's expected is that the places where we should experience the strong and strongest mind-body dissonance are the places where we should show the strongest preference for the brain. Dissonance should be strongest when we think about things like knowledge, right? Because it's my knowledge of stuff that should be most ephemeral, more ephemeral than, say, my sensations. So you would expect a stronger dissonance for knowledge than sensations, and therefore stronger preference for brain explanations there. That's exactly what we found. So this and other results suggest the possibility that it is dualism, and specifically our discomfort with mind-body interactions, that motivate our preference for the brain. And in fact, when you look at the same literature, the literature on the seductive allure of neuroscience, most of those results in fact come from examples in which people are invited to reason about knowledge and cognition rather than about motor skills, about sensations and emotions, and that's exactly expected. So dualism may be one culprit. Essentialism may also have something to say there because if you're an essentialist, then when you get evidence that a psychological trait resides in the body, then you're getting evidence suggesting that the trait could possibly be innate. It satisfies the condition for innateness. I want to break in here to remind you about our loyal sponsor, Text Expander. Text Expander allows you to work smarter, not harder. Use Text Expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations to streamline and speed up everything you type. Plus, it will eliminate those embarrassing typos. Best of all, you can use it on any platform and in any app. I've been using Text Expander for years, and I know I would feel lost without it. To give it a try, visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast for 20% off your first year. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget to tell them you heard about it on Brain Science. Essentialism requires that innateness must reside in the body. And therefore, if you're told it's in the body, you are getting one point in favor of the possibility that this trait is innate. If that's how you view things, then by learning that something is in your brain, then you might be interpreting as suggesting that that trait actually defines who you are. It defines your essence. It's telling you something very deep about you as a human. 
if that's the case, then it is possible that people actually interpret brain information as evidence for innateness. This is something that we are investigating now. Some of our published work actually supports this because we know that when we tell people that a certain trait is in the brain, people become reliably more likely to infer that the trait in question is in fact innate. So we think that their essentialism could well contribute to that. So together, dualism and essentialism really put us in the bind here. I want to talk now a little bit more about why this matters. Let's talk about people's attitudes about mental illness and how this plays out with mental illness. Right. So Mental illness indeed is is puzzling because you would expect that in the era of the brain, people should think about psychiatric conditions as diseases like all others, right? So when we know a person has cancer, you don't shun them because they have a physical illness. That's not the case for psychiatric disorders. And there was, in fact, a large campaign in the 90s by the U.S. Surgeon General trying to destigmatize mental disorders precisely by presenting them as brain disease with the hope that people would view them as diseases or others. And the stigma that, that is very well documented towards psychiatric disorders, the hope was that this is going to go away. And it didn't. There is research that shows that documents the stigma. And in fact, research shows that when told that psychiatric disorders are associated with genetic explanations, people are in fact, their attitudes in effect are worse. And that is surprising. Now, if you think about it from the point of essentialism, that of course makes sense, right? Because if you think that your essence is innate as in an immutable, and you're told that a disease form parts of your essence because it's innate, then it is immutable. No matter what you do, it's not going to change. It's not going to respond to treatment. It's going to you know, share it with your family by virtue of innateness and so forth. So that explains a lot of the attitudes. Interestingly, some more recent results suggest that people extend the same negative attitudes even when they're just told that the disease is in the brain, when they're not told that it is genetic. And of course, when told that it's genetic, it makes sense that people believe it's innate, which will trigger essentialism. But why should the belief that something is in the brain, why that should be sufficient to trigger this essentialist thinking? The theory that uh, I advance in here in this book explains that because if essentialist reasoning really assumes that the essence is material in the body, then once again, by satisfying this assumption, then you will increase essentialist reasoning. And to test this possibility, what we did in the lab is presented people with much description of psychiatric patients with a diagnosis. So you said that patient X was diagnosed by a brain test, patient B was diagnosed by a behavioral test, and all we did is tell people the test was given by the brain. We didn't tell them anything about what brain area it is, which would provide them additional information, nothing of the kind. All they got is confirmation that the person has a disease, and the confirmation either came from the brain or it came from behavior without mentioning the body. People were more likely to think that the disorder is innate when presented with brain explanation compared to behavioral explanation. They also had social attitudes were actually mixed, but there were some social attitudes that were actually worse when provided with brain explanation compared to behavioral explanation. So the proposal is that essentialism backfires in as much that we hope that By mentioning the brain, we are going to reduce stigma, but because people are essentialists and because they are further dualists, we get the opposite consequence. So essentialism itself makes us believe that if it's in the brain, it's more likely to be innate. Because we are dualists, when we are told it's in behavior, we don't necessarily assume the same. We don't necessarily assume that if it's in behavior, it's also in the brain. We say, well, behavior is compatible with some other cause that is not in the brain or not in the body. And therefore, we treat brain and behavioral explanation differently. And we tend to stigmatize disorders that are associated with brain explanations, which is unfortunate. 
the hope is that by recognizing those biases, you can do something about it, right? That, that by recognizing that this is how you interpret that and that your interpretation is wrong, you're now provided with a, a tool that hopefully would allow you to counteract this bias. And would you talk for a minute about people's attitude toward treatment, how that's influenced? So in other work, we know from the literature that when people told that the disorder has brain biological genetic cause, they believe that drug treatment is going to be more successful and talk therapy is going to be less effective. You can reason about why they think that the drug therapy is going to be effective. Well, maybe if you understand the scientific basis, it's going to help. But why should people think that talk therapy is not effective. There is nothing in that that says anything about the effectiveness of talk therapy. Well, of course, if you're a dualist, then it follows because talk therapy does not affect the body and therefore it cannot interact with, with the physical cause. So yes, that's the same attitudes also explain biases with respect to treatment. Yeah. And you also mentioned that people are more pessimistic when they think that it's in the brain, which seems like a paradox, right? Without your explanation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also, it's another finding that we found as well. People think that the disease is going to be more lengthy when you tell them that this disease in, in the brain. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So last but not least, this whole idea that some kinds of diseases somehow are different with the example of dyslexia. Would you tell us about that? Sure. So the claim, again, is that the same... Just as we think about thoughts and feelings as different, thoughts being in the mind and feeling being in the body, thoughts being learned and emotions being innate, the same contrast fits into how we think disease, about diseases that affect the affect. That's how we think about psychiatric disorder and diseases that affect thinking, as which is the case for dyslexia. We would expect the same dissociations between these two classes of disorders. So maybe I should say first about, I, I don't know if your uh, audience is familiar with dyslexia. Should they say uh, a word about what it is? Just review the evidence about how it really works, because it's been a while. So dyslexia is a difficulty in attaining reading skill despite having sufficient training. Basically, dyslexia is a surprise. It's a case in which a child does not learn how to read when you would expect them to be able to do so based on their learning experiences under some definitions also based on their intelligence. We know that dyslexia is a hereditary brain disorder. There is ample documentation of brain abnormalities in people with dyslexia. We know of some gene candidates that are involved in dyslexia, many of them. I should say, however, that dyslexia is a heterogeneous condition because dyslexia is defined by the surprise, not, not by a particular cause that explains it, it stands to reason that children may fail to learn how to read for many reasons. So dyslexia is bound to include a wide variety of syndromes. Nonetheless, when you look at what actually is happening, you see that in many, many cases, there is a common set of characteristics that define people with dyslexia. One is the particular problem with reading, what they have, the, the, the bottleneck or the aspect of reading that they find most difficult is the mapping of letters to sounds. So if I re read dog, then I can read it by how we taught to do phonics, right? So you know that D sounds like a D, O sounds like an O. You put all those together, you assemble it together as you do in Ikea, right? You put all those things from scratch. Combine those sounds, and that's how you know how to read the word. This is a problem for people with dyslexia. They have specific difficulties in this area. So this gives you already a sense that the problem has to do with not just letters, but rather with the mapping of letters to sounds. It turns out that people with dyslexia have a whole host of other problems in the processing of spoken language. They have problems with awareness to the structure of spoken language. So does dog and fog rhyme, an area of difficulty. They even have problems in speech perception. So when you look at infants who are at risk for dyslexia because they are born to families where dyslexia runs in the family, their speech perception is atypical compared to control. So that in, already shows you that the problem arises well before the child learns 
how to read, and it has to do with processing the sound structure of language and speech perception. That's not what people think. When you ask lay people, what do you think dyslexia is? They immediately tell you it's letter confusion. It's the confusion of B with D and so forth. This is not to say that no person with dyslexia ever have visual problems. And there is research that suggests that some individuals with dyslexia do have visual problems. But it's not necessarily the confusion of B to D. Stanislas Dehan, who I know was one of your guests, I had really interesting research that shows that these confusions arise in every normal child. And this is something that we eventually overcome when we learn how to read. So it's not a symptom of dyslexia specifically. Visual problems also are not the most characteristic of people with dyslexia, but rather it's those problems with processing sounds and decoding the sound structure of language that is the problem that you see most frequently. Yet that's not what lay people think. They think that the problem is visual, and they think that those problems in sound processing are not likely to be a characteristic. So when you ask people to volunteer what they think is the main problem, they think the problem is visual rather than mapping letters to sounds. They think that the visual problems are innate, but when you ask them to reason about difficulties with letter, mapping letters to sounds, they think that they're not innate or they don't have an innate basis. They don't have a brain basis that they are not a biological problem, which we know to be wrong. I should make it clear, and that's where things get a little tricky here. Learning to map letters to sound, this is obviously a learned skill. This is not something that we are born with. But this cognitive capacity recruits brain and cognitive mechanisms that are dedicated innately for language, and that is the innate basis for learning this skill. We have run experiments in which we presented people with much description of people with dyslexia and told them one person have problems mapping letters to sound, another person have problems with reversible letters, visual problems. Which one is actually more likely to have dyslexia? Which one is actually likely to have a brain disorder? Which one is likely to have an innate disorder? And the answer in all cases is the visual problem is more likely to define dyslexia, to indicate dyslexia. It's more likely to be a brain disorder. It's more likely to be innate. And this is actually factually wrong. The proposal advance here explains that, right? Because for us, vision is in our eyes. So it's easy to think how visual problems can be innate. And if we think about dyslexia as a disorder that has a heritable basis, it's much easier for us to blame vision than to actually identify the true cause. And the results bear this possibility out. And this has implications for attitudes toward treating dyslexia, doesn't it? Well, understanding the right cause, the, the correct causes of dyslexia obviously have implications for treating it. So we have a lab, another line of research in the lab that actually looks at dyslexia, and this information certainly is relevant for treating the disorder. As far as attitudes towards dyslexia, I agree with you, it is relevant in as much as if we misjudge the causes of dyslexia, if a teacher believes that dyslexia is only a visual problem, then if she sees a child who struggles with phonemic awareness and with rhyming, then she won't identify this child as having difficulties. And in fact, there is research that shows that teachers and teachers in training suffer from the same misconceptions. So to the extent that teachers and parents fail to identify the real problems in dyslexia, then that will prevent those children from getting the help that they need, and, and that's a huge problem. You mentioned several times throughout the book that people seem to tie the idea of innateness with immutability, that it can't change, can't be fixed. And that's essentialism, right? That's totally essentialism, and you're totally right. So in fact, yeah, if you adopt this view, then indeed you might be much more pessimistic about the potential for remediation, which we know to be true. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. And then it even goes so far as to make it hard for people to understand evolution, because evolution is the opposite of essentialism, isn't it? It totally. And there is indeed, so one of the big 
fields that look at essentialism indeed ties it to evolution. So the whole point about evolution is understanding that individual members of the species can vary and can differ from each other. And it's these random mutations that are the food for natural selection. But people don't think about it this way. They think that if variation occurs, it occurs to all members of the species because they all must be identical and they all share this same immutable essence. And therefore, this notion that there can be variation between individual members of the species is very difficult for people to grasp. This is the work of Andrew Stulman, and this kind of attitude indeed stands in the way of grasping evolution. So yes, that, that's totally true. Iris, what else would you like to share before we close? I don't have very much else to share, except for if knowing ourselves is difficult, right? This is the hardest thing to do. And I hope that this discussion gives us more concrete evidence as to why that's the case, why knowing ourselves is so difficult. It's not insurmountable. And perhaps this is something that is important to emphasize. So Yes, we have dualism, and yes, we have essentialism, and yes, they whisper these crazy mantras in our ears, but then we have reasoning, and we have rationalities, and we have tools to counteract them, and the hope is that by understanding our biases, we should be able to better understand ourselves. Do you have any advice for students who might be interested in getting into cognitive science? Interesting. Cognition matters. Right. I think that partly because of the reasons we discuss, there is lesser interest in cognition and huge fascination with the brain. Neuroscience is great. I do some research that involves the brain, transcranial ma magnetic stimulation myself. I think there are some specific answers that you can get from the brain. But I think that cognition is still the horse before the cart. I think that our understanding today, the questions that we follow are posed by cognition, less so by neuroscience as far as we see it. And, and I'm somewhat worried about neuroscience being a bit of a distraction in shaping the questions that we ask. And in fact, this is something that you see not only in cognition and neuroscience, but you also see that in artificial intelligence, there are these same kind of discussions these days with the rise of deep learning. There is the question of how should we integrate, if we want to emulate human cognition, we better understand how human cognition works. And cognition still, I think, offers our best hope for tackling these issues. As far as broader advice, I think it's really important for young people to follow their North Star, so to speak, right? Follow the big questions. There is a reason why each and every one of us got into the field. And the reason wasn't because we wanted to look at this particular area of the brain or the other particular area of the brain, but rather there was a really big question about how the mind works that we are trying to answer. And I think it's as you get into your training, it's very easy to forget those big questions. And I think that the first advice is follow the big questions. The second advice is stay on earth, right? So we need to be able to have specific fruit flies, so to speak, as the geneticists talk about, in order to address these big questions, but always have this dialogue between the North Star that is driving you and earth where you are. And the third one is fight for your ideas. I think that sometimes we tend to think that when you run into a discovery, then everything is going to be great and the doors of heaven is going to open and everybody is going to recognize it. And we know from the history of science that that often doesn't follow and that new big ideas take a while to be accepted. So fight for your ideas, go far, fly high, keep to the evidence and fight for your views. I want to thank Iris Barrent for coming on Brain Science to talk about her thought-provoking book, The Blind Storyteller, How We Reason About Human Nature. She summarized her book as, quote, the claim that we are inherently blind to our nature and, as it turns out, our blindness to human nature arises from human nature itself from the very principles that very likely could be innate to humans, end quote. 
If you are new to brain science, you may be wondering why we didn't spend more time reviewing the evidence that essentialism and dualism are universal biases that all humans appear to share. Dr. Barrett provides this evidence in her book, but these ideas should be familiar to longtime listeners. I mentioned Robert Burton, but Bruce Hood is also another guest who has written extensively about this topic. I will include additional references in the show notes at brainsciencepodcast.com. It's very difficult to do justice to a book in a short conversation, so I want to encourage you to read The Blind Storyteller if you want to learn more. For me, the key idea of this book was that when we look at dualism and essentialism carefully, we realize that they're actually incompatible. Barrett calls this the perfect storm. But the cool thing is that this conflict may shed some light on why we often reach conclusions intuitively that turn out to be wrong. Michael Graziano is another guest who has observed that we are hardwired to be dualist because the processes of our brain are inaccessible. That's what makes the mind feel like something non-material. In contrast, from babyhood, we see other living things as possessing some special essence. Neither of these intuitions goes away when we learn science. Thus, we intuitively accept that emotions are innate and resist explanations that include a cognitive component. Conversely, we struggle with accepting the possibility that ideas can be innate. For example, in episode 170, Andreas Nieder shared the evidence that many animals share an innate number sense. Likely, you found this discovery surprising and maybe even a little discomforting. The main reason I invited Dr. Barrett onto brain science is that I think that the blind storyteller provides a valuable perspective on why people, including scientists, often react to scientific evidence in surprising and even paradoxical ways. For example, no one predicted that emphasizing the brain basis of mental illness would actually lead to more stigma and more pessimism about treatment. I would love to to hear your feedback about this episode, you can write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Please visit brainscience.com for complete show notes and episode transcripts. And if you'd like to get episode show notes automatically every month, sign up for the free newsletter on the website or text the word brain science as all one word to 55 Four four four. That's brain science, all one word, to five five four four four. And don't forget to check out my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. You can get that on the website or at your favorite ebook seller. This show is supported by listeners like you. If you'd like to learn more, please go to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Next month, I will be talking with Jeff Hawkins about his brand new book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Until then, I hope you'll check out my other podcasts, Books and Ideas and Grain Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is copyright 2021 to Virginia Campbell, M.D., you may copy it to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mindfire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.